What is going on everyone? It's Sean from All Things EV and I've got the pleasure of being here at Bollinger Motors here in Detroit with the CEO, Robert Bollinger. Robert, thanks so much for having me here. Sure, thanks for coming. This is great. Absolutely. So um, I, want, I want to give everyone sort of a, a, a deep dive into the company, your vehicles, your upcoming vehicles. There's a lot of people that are really excited about what's going on at Bollinger. So um, when we were talking off camera, you, you've got a real interesting story about how you ended up to this point that you're at right now. Um, how did you get to the point where you started a company that is one of the, in one of the most capital intensive industries, automotive? How did you get here? <laughs> right, right. Um, I wonder that sometimes in the yes, middle of the right. night. How did I? How did I get to this point? Yeah. Um, so basically, as a kid, I wanted to be a, a car guy, and, and basically had my own car company even as a as a kid. So I used to draw logos, mm -hmm. draw cars, all that kind of stuff. At the time, I was always like you know mimicking Ferraris and Lamborghini kind of drawings. So I uh, went to school for industrial design. Wanted to be a car stylist, car designer, whatnot. Um, didn't know like whether to go the engineering route or the design route. So I went down to the design path. When I graduated college, uh, I interviewed in Europe actually. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you don't know enough car stuff because yeah. I was an industrial designer. So I thought, oh, you know what? I'll go back to school, uh, grad school and become a stylist. Moved to New York, got a job to start to help pay for that. It never happened because yeah. you just can't save money in New York. Yeah. So I uh, got a job in advertising and then started this whole career in advertising, mm -hmm. marketing, and uh, and then met a friend who started his own hair care company. So I was for free doing logos and design stuff for him. He made me a partner in the company uh, because he couldn't pay me. Yes. So it was a, I yeah. was a junior partner and then the company kept growing and growing and I ended up running the company. We sold that in 2013. Yep. And then that's when I was just like, oh, what, you know, I had the luxury, yeah. super great, uh, fortunate situation of like, what, what can I do now? And I thought, well, let's try automotive. You came back to the automotive? Yeah, how hard can it be? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. That's, that's the, yeah. that's what everyone thinks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I joke with uh, the, the my team, the engineers who actually know, you know, how to build something like this is, uh, I said, if I, you know, the ignorance was helpful that I did not know how incredibly intensive it would be. And so it was just like, hey, let's try it, was a good way to start this whole thing. Because then once you start it, it's, it just keeps going. So. In, in, in some ways, it's almost better that you were so blue-eyed yeah. and didn't know any right. better about, right. about the industry. Because maybe if you knew, maybe as much as you know now, you would have talked yourself out of, <laughs> yeah. out of uh, getting into right. creating a, an electric vehicle. Yeah. And, and, and you know, not just a, a vehicle, but an electric vehicle in a market that's you know, a lot of changing technology for batteries. Every, everything is just moving at light speed, it seems right, like. Right, right. And when, uh, basically we started in 2015, which is not that long ago, right? A couple of years, you know, a few years ago. So um, Carl Hacken, our chief engineer, was our first the first uh, employee, the, you know, uh, just the two of us. And then CJ came on board and then we just grew from there. But um, at first it was, uh, just back in 2015, it was completely different than it is now. So trying to find an onboard charger that met our needs or anything, it was just like it wasn't out there. Motors for a truck of this size didn't exist. There, anything being made then was for, you know, little hatchbacks and little, you know, very efficient small vehicles. And that's great, but it didn't serve us. So we had to find different ways to get to this point. What made you want to make an electric vehicle versus just something that, you know, was was more sort of Defender or or Scout style gas right. guzzler type vehicle? Why EV? EV. Uh, I just believe that's where everything's going to go. I thought that for a while now, um, and basically what was happening is when I was living in upstate New York, I was looking for to buy an electric vehicle. And we had a farm, and there's lots of snow up there. We have lots of mud, all this kind of stuff. And I test drove a lot of electric vehicles, fully electric. You know, that's the way I wanted to go. And there wasn't anything that quite fit how I could use it. You know, I didn't need a sedan. I didn't need a hatchback kind of thing. And I was like, what I need is a truck. Something more capable. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a very capable truck, something that can handle off-road, something that can handle lots of weight, you know, a lot of payload, all that kind of stuff. So basically, this is, came out of that need, of, and, and definitely, you know, when we launched this, it was the first yeah. fully electric truck. 
So um, it was original and still is, and, and I don't think anyone else is going to make something like this. Yeah, I agree. Is the, is, is the passion for electric an environmental thing? Is it a performance thing? Um, why, is, why is electrification, why is creating an electric vehicle the way to go for, for Bollinger? For me, I think it's both environmental and efficient. You know, the whole idea of it being efficient, that's, I kind of strive to be efficient in lots yeah. of different ways, right? So just the idea that the motors are, you know, 90, 95% efficient, the fact that all homes have electric coming to them already, uh, just so many ways that electric just makes sense, right? And then environmentally, so, uh, you, know, you know, tailpipe emissions, obviously, stuff like that. And then obviously now, in the past few years, the, the huge ramp up of individual states being more and more where they produce their electric mm -hmm. in a green way, right? So it's obviously it goes back to how do you get your electricity in the mm -hmm. first place, mm -hmm. right? So um, all of that combined is, is really the thing. And then when I was on the farm, it was like, okay, now how do you use those desires, but you can actually get something done. So it's all of that combined. You've got a, 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 an acumen for uh, running a business. Um, you walked away uh, with, with a nice chunk of change and decided to start an automotive company, an electric automotive company. Um, did, you, did you have a lot of funding for, for this from you know, some of these big automakers interested in, in seeing this technology come to play? Yeah, uh, yeah. When I sold, uh, when we sold the company in 2013, I I was very fortunate what I got from that, and so I thought, what better way than to spend it all yeah. <laughs> on yes. a on a childhood dream, right? So um, I'm very, you know, I don't need much, so yep. I was like, yeah, let's do this. So um, uh, yeah, so it's been, been self-funded. Yeah, fully funded by me since the beginning. It still is. It is will be through the year and and onward. But we are doing, uh, you know. Uh, looking now for capital raise for mm -hmm. the next big rounds of, of activity, of course. But yeah, that's been great about it, is that it's been a small team, it's been funded by me, it's been decided just by you know, me and the immediate engineers working on stuff. So uh, we put everything into it that we wanted and we didn't compromise in any kind of way. And, uh, and now even now we're taking it to production and, and talking closely with vendors, working with them, they're making things to our specs, and, and the EV world has changed so much that we can now start finding components that fit our needs. So it's all kind of, you know, coming it's, it's together. It's happening at the right time frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah super. Um, I think that that is a really remarkable part of this early story of yours, which is you've, you've self-funded the company up until now, which is giving you a lot of flexibility and mobility to make decisions and uh, now you're ready to sort of take that next step and accelerate the company, right. the, the, the production of, of building these cars and eventually getting these out into the consumer's right. hands. Um, what I've seen a lot in, in the software industry, which is the, the, the industry that I came from before I got into real estate, <clears throat> a lot of companies would, a lot of companies would um, take funding and they give away a part of the company, and then they'd spend like crazy on just wild right. and and crazy things to, yeah. to you know some some had good intentions to attract the right talent mm -hmm. to offer the the perks and benefits of of working for a forward thinking company, um, but what what I sort of saw as an observer in that industry is that these companies didn't spend the money like it was their own. They Correct. spent it like it was someone yes. else's, yes. and so. I think that's an admirable part of, of this story of Bollinger is that you've self-funded this and because of that, because it's, you're, you're actually stroking the check for every single you know, expenditure in the every company, check I it, write, it, yeah. feel, it, it hurts <laughs> well, a little Chris bit Chris writes more. it, I sign it. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. I think it's a really, really great part of the, of the story. So where do things stand right now? Um, what are you working on and, and what does that look like? You've talked about some, some things, some vehicles that I don't think pe very many people have seen yet. So right, right. you've created this, what, what, what we see behind us, which is the B1. Right. Yeah, this is the B1 two door. This is the one that you see on our website and in, in the press, any photos, any video is this, is this one right here. So uh, we made it operable right away because we thought you can't just unveil it and you know, pull a sheet off of it, it's got to move, it's got to work, 
and with our timing and wanting to learn everything with everything we do and take it to the next step, it had to be fully electric operational. So we did that and we took it around the country and uh, took it to Moab, we took it to Colorado, we took it a lot, lots of places off, off road to test it ourselves, feel it of course. Then we took it to test tracks, um, you know, put the sensors all over it, took all the data we could from it, um, took all of that knowledge, went back and started making the four door version because we know we wanted to make a four door B1. And so with that, all that data went into the CAD, and all of our learning, the engineering firms that we were working with along the way, our vendor support on, on each of the components that came in. So the next prototypes that we're building now will be just you know, exponentially um, more progressed than this yeah. one, let's say. But that, I, I hate to say anything about this because this mm -hmm. is an amazing mm -hmm. proof of concept vehicle that you can drive anywhere right now. But the next ones are, if this one's 100% hand built, the next ones are 95% production ready. And so those will be revealing towards the end of the summer. It's the four door version of this and the four door pickup version of, the, of this. And the pickup and, uh, and the SUT, we call it, sport utility truck, right? They both share the same components up to the C pillar and then there's a bed. Mm -hmm. So they all have the same DNA, same portal gear, gear hubs, 15 inch ground clearance, all the, all the specs you see on our website are, are gonna follow through all of our trucks. What I love about, about this vehicle and, and vehicles is, is that it's, the word that I used was, was, was retro. You know, it, I felt like I was, I was taking a step back in time to the 1960s. In terms of design, this, mm -hmm. is, not, this is not high gloss uh, refinement like you would probably see in the Tesla Model X. Right. Um, this is something different. What inspired you to do this style versus something a little bit more on the other end of the spectrum like what Tesla does? Right, right. Well, probably a few dif different reasons. My own personal aesthetic is this. So when I was designing it, I, you know, I like mid-century modern kind of stuff. So I like, the, I like timeless. So I figured uh, if, a, if it's electric and you're coming out with it new, and you make it look futuristic, it's gonna look old in about a month and a half, right? So I was just like, I love timeless, I love uh, square, you know, uh, I love drawing buildings as much as cars back in the day, so like it's kind of like a moving greenhouse is kind of in a way. So um, yeah, I just wanted that timeless look. Also when we were hand building it, we didn't wanna sound off to have fenders stamped for us and worry about all the curves and all that kind of stuff. So. Basically, we wanted to bring in metal and bend it ourselves and, and come up with a design as a group. So uh, there's a lot of back and forth with the look, but basically this is the arena I wanted to be in. And then once you're working with a truck of, the, of a certain kind of dimension with flat sides, you're in that world that people will bring up, you know, Land Rovers, Broncos kind of stuff. So there's no intentional, you know, we're in their world by going this path of building it. So. But I love all those references because that's, that's exactly what I love. I want to have this for the rest of my life. I want anyone who buys one, they have it for the rest of their life and it's, it always looks... I love, I love the timeless yeah. aspect of it. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I was smiling inside when you, when you mentioned the mid-century modern because if, uh, for anyone who follows the real estate side of what I do, I talk a lot about mid-century modern because personally I, yeah. I really appreciate the design in that it's, it's timeless, it's efficient, it's, you know, sort of being influenced by, by nature and, mm. and bringing the outside in. So I can, I can see right. how that has influenced the design of, of these vehicles. Yeah. And also like we wanted the front space to be as big as possible. So if you put a, you know, not only with a big, you know, angle on it, yep. look kind of funny, but also you cut your, your space in half. So um, that also I wanted as much glass as possible for visibility, both above and around and everything. So you could see everything that you're, you know, driving through nature kind of thing. So really it was just like, keep everything, keep all other influencers at a minimum and make how you're gonna use it and why you're using it. And when you're sitting in there to the fullest extent you can, so. Yeah, this, I mean, the, the design approach is, is real simplicity. I mean, there, there, right. there's, there's not a lot of bells and whistles, yeah. right? And that's, that's been right. intentional on mm -hmm. your part. You're not gonna have a 17 inch touchscreen right. on the interior. Yeah. 
yeah. simple, Sim simple dials, simple gauges. Mm -hmm. That that's your yeah. We have we have actual gauges with needles moving, and then we have a little screen that you can toggle through for MPGE and and how many miles left, that kind of thing. So we'll have a full you know vehicle control unit, listening to everything, controlling everything, very you know. Up, you know, all the technology you need to yeah. have in there to have an electric vehicle that's safe, that works the way you want to, all that kind of stuff. It's just that it won't be in your face. You can turn that screen off if you want to and just be off-roading, you know, or yeah. whatever you're doing. So, What are some of the functional features that you think people will really, really like about these vehicles? Um, a lot of people love that we have portal in-wheel portal gear hubs to give you that full 15-inch ground clearance all the way across. They love the hydrodynamic suspension that's that you can uh, this manually adjustable, so you can go up to 20 inches down to 10. So you can lower it to get out. You can raise it to 20 inches, almost all the way across, to go over, you know, shopping carts even <laughs> maybe I don't know. And then, um, but uh, obviously off road, if you you know miss you know misjudge something, you just raise it up and go over it. Uh, a big thing that we get a lot of uh, feedback on is the pass through mm -hmm. through the dash. So without that need for a firewall, right? Uh, and we have a big open front, because it's like open that up. So on the four door B2, you're gonna be able to hold 13 inch boards internally with the tailgates up. On the pickup truck, it's gonna be 16 inch, 16 foot. So that's a lot longer than you can put in a pickup now, even hanging out the back, because you'd have like eight feet dragging. So it's, you know, our truck's gonna be more capable than anything that's out there, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the electric side is, is, you know, far and away. Again, like I think of like the different things that this truck brings to you. One of them is that it's electric and it's, it's we didn't just electrify a truck. You know, we recreated the architecture of, of what a truck can do, right? So the electric part, especially for off-road, just to be able to just barely tap on the throttle, but you have the full power of the grip to uh, rock crawl. What, what can people expect on the performance side? What can you share with everyone? I know there's, there's a lot of details that you still want to um, uh, withhold until the right time, but what, what, what performance specs do you think um, can, can you share with people? Well, right now we have it um, uh, in our calculations because we have to still do a lot of uh, testing, physical testing, but our calculations, we're thinking the zero to 60 is gonna be under five seconds, which is pretty good for a 5,000 pound truck. Um, it's going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, it's going to hold 5,000 pounds because it's a class three truck. So everything has to be engineered to 10,001 pounds. So we're going to have to do that testing to prove that the brakes, the leveling system, all that kind of stuff. It's, you're, we're going to have to put 5,000 pounds on it. And we actually did that already with this one. Put 5,000 pounds on it and see if it operates the way it, it needs to, stopping distance, all that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, if you put 5,000 pounds on, it's going to change your range, but it's a matter of, you know, as batteries improve along the lines, we already have the mechanical DNA power and capability in our truck to accept new batteries as they happen. It just keeps getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Range-wise, um, what will people see when these vehicles hit the road? These first round would be 200 miles, and that's combined EPA. And so um, stop and go city traffic or off-roading, it'll be higher than that. Um, it's a blocky truck, so, you know, big wheels. So if you're out on the highway a lot, it's going to be lower than that. But um, that wasn't our intention. We don't think this is the truck you would drive across the country with, you know, kind of thing. This is more for your, you know, farm, for your off-roading, for, you know, that kind of thing. But um, definitely stop and go. It'll be more than 200 miles. Mm -hmm. um, in, terms of, in terms of battery pack management, can you share anything about how it will be um, managing temperature of, of battery pack? Will it have a, a, a passive cooling or an active cooling? Yeah, it'll be active cooling. We'll have a, you know, liquid cooled. Mm -hmm. So the motors, batteries, a couple of the other components, um, motors, inverters, are the other major components and the batteries will all be water cooled. Uh, liquid cooled. So uh, that's why in the new designs, the radiators are bigger, the air in through the front and out the top is more because we had to incorporate all of that thermal, all that thermal need. So we have all that. So everything's liquid cooled. So the biggest thing <clears throat> is, uh, you know, keeping the batteries in that, in that the nice window, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the battery pack will be both heated and cooled. Mm -hmm. So it'll 
you know, for it's, the longest life. It's going to be great for any temperature. I mean, you know, yeah. so if I'm in Colorado yeah. and I want to take this up to the mountains, yeah. it's not only going to have the, 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 the torque and the performance to, to get up and down, but it's going to help manage that temperature of the battery pack. Yeah, because some EVs you can buy, like the, where you know, certain EVs are sold in Canada with heating, but not somewhere else and that kind of stuff. This will come with heating and cooling in, Standard. Every, in every vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so whether you, you know, live in Southern California, but then you, you know, go up to Bear Mountain for a long time, or, you know, or, yeah. or go drive up into Alaska, whatever, it'll, it'll adjust. Dual motor, quad motor? Dual motor, there's one on each axle. So it's uh, the front and back are mirrored. So you have the, the motor and gearbox inverter combo, and then it goes off half axles that then go into the portal gear hubs down into the wheels. Mm -hmm. And the battery pack is um, sort of a skateboard style, sitting in the yeah. floor pan. Yeah, the whole bottom and the, and the middle, underneath all the passengers and through the middle compartment that we have. So it's one big pack from mm -hmm. the bottom. Mm -hmm. And we needed all that space for the battery pack size that we need. Yeah. So um, that'll come up from the bottom. And then we have basically three, three layers between the outside world and the pat and the batteries because that's a concern is like safety that way so we have an outside skid plate then a space <clears throat> then like the individual pack inside that and then the the containers holding the modules so it's it's very protected yeah you got some layers there yeah. so especially with your off-roading not that you're going to hit something hard off-roading but we don't want anything going past a little bit you know <laughs> any right. little bend in it is is we don't want anything like that. So, in terms of in terms of safety, uh, the underside of the vehicle is is going to be well engineered to yeah. be able to take anything that you would throw at it right. off road. Right. Plus, we're already our ride height is 15 inches, and a lot of times kick up into the the bottom is because you're so low. That's part of the danger is how close you are to the road. We're 15 inches off the ground going down the highway as it is, so that's already a certain amount of safety there too. So. Talk about some of the uh, safety features of the vehicle. Um, you've really put some thought into how to make sure that this is a safe vehicle for people. Right, thanks, yeah. So it's a class three truck. It uh, has a different set of regulations than a passenger vehicle. So what we're doing is uh, basically coming up with our own list of safety points that we wanna hit that are beyond the regulations of a class three truck. So roof crush analysis, um, you know, uh, we're all of our, we're doing a lot of simulated crash testing. We're bringing down the pulse point. This is something for engineers to talk about better mm -hmm. than me, but the pulse point of when, of when there's a crash, uh, you don't want it, you want it to crumple obviously mm -hmm. and absorb that kind of thing. So we're doing all of that simulation. So, um, you know, the seatbelt mounts. So all of that testing we're doing because it's our own set of due care, if you will, like to make sure it's safe because I want to drive it, you know. I want everyone I know to have one, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's to, for it to be safe is uh, is definitely a big part of our strategy. One of the things that, that class three vehicles don't require is is the airbag piece. I did see people talking about that online. Right. So, um, what what was your thought process around that? Yeah, well, I believe the federal government has a class three classification that doesn't not requiring that because I believe they think that's a low volume mm -hmm. segment mm -hmm. uh, and we are low volume. So we are just going into that segment. It's there, it's fully you know, uh, legal. And they, like I said, we're going beyond the legal requirements of that, of that grouping. But basically it's, it's a big part of it too is that class three trucks are the bigger vehicles on the road. And so we all know that something bigger, something smaller, who's at an advantage. So. I believe that's why the, the federal government and the whole world actually, because we're, we're homologating this, I always mess that word up, mm -hmm. uh, for many markets. So this, our B1 and B2 will be ready for uh, US, Canada, Australia, Europe, and ECE. And ECE is like a Africa and mm -hmm. like countries that outside of those zones. It's gonna zones. be great for that. Yeah. yeah. So, and we have um, interest from a lot of people in a lot of those places. So eventually we'll export eventually we will have a right-hand side. And all of those uh, regulations have a class three similar to our class three. Yeah. You've built this for, for international export in mind, right? Yeah. So it's gonna be pretty seamless to switch it to right-hand drive. Yeah. yeah, and if you see the pictures online, uh, the 
front, the dash is a mirror of itself. So there's a panel, then a middle panel, then a panel. And so we can just switch all that stuff. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than just that, but it'll look exactly the same, just reverse. Uh, you're going to be coming out with the, the four-door versions of these vehicles first. What timeline, what's the timeline look like on that? When will people be able to um, see these on the road? So our next prototypes, the ones that are like this close to production, are, we'll be debuting those towards the end of summer. And then uh, we'll be building all of our test vehicles to do all of our testing on right on the heels of that. And uh, we'll be hopefully signing our, uh, the final paperwork on our building in Detroit to do the assembly. That'll be this summer and we'll move into there and hopefully start, you know, the plan is to have production starting next year. It's great. So, yeah. and, and, and this is not mass production robots, yeah, right. you know, alien dreadnought that, that, right. that Elon has talked so much about. This is, this is, these are going to be made with a lot of love right. and, and hand, hand built for every owner. Right. And we're working very closely with our, all of our vendors and the, all the vendors that are in Michigan. That's why we moved here for the vendors and all of the engineers and all of the other support staff that a car company needs is all here. So it's made it a million times easier to find great people that we've moved here. New York, I love. I love upstate New York. It's beautiful. Um, I could have stayed there the rest of my life, but it's not, it doesn't have the automotive support uh, that we needed to get this uh, off the ground. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, with the help of our vendors, we're making major components for us to our specs, obviously, to our designs, and bring it all together and, and have it in a facility where uh, basically, it goes from station to station, not even on a conveyor belt. We we'll just push it along mm -hmm. and, and build the first first few years there. So. Um, I, I would be remiss to not mention charging. Um, a lot of people were very, very curious about uh, what type of charging and charging network. So what, what will people see in terms of charging availability, capacity? What can you share? Yeah, so we have, we'll have a CCS port on it. And so um, level one, two, three, right? All combined in there. And uh, you know, I tweeted Elon about you know super joining the, the supercharging station uh, network. But uh, for for these prototypes, we'll be doing CCS. And um, so uh, those will be on there. We have a, a very large onboard charger to adapt for that. And that charger is also combo uh, back power out. So we have like eight plugs on the vehicle and uh, the amount of wattage it can handle for, for tools and stuff like that is very high. So it's, it'll be more than just being able to use a laptop. You can power circular saws and table saws off it and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's gonna have a lot of power in, a lot of power out. <laughs> have, have, you, have you finalized the uh, charging rate that this will be able to take yet? Yeah, that, that is, is extremely complicated. That gets very, because the whole thing is uh, in all of our studies and for any vehicle is that the, the time of charging is where you're the most heat, the most stress that you can be doing. Um, and if you're, you know, if you own this in Nevada and you're charging and it's 110 degrees outside, then you're even, you know, more so. So that rate of charge is everything. Yep. So that's what we're finalizing now. What, yep. what, what's the, the limit we can take it to safely and keep the batteries for their whole intended lifespan and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but knowing that 80% of people charge at home, level one or level two, but we want to know what's the maximum we can charge in. I think there definitely is a happy medium, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you, you, could, you could increase the charge rate to 350 kilowatts, but then you're also having an impact <clears> on the longevity <throat> of the batteries. You've talked about right. how you want this to be something that is owned for a very, very long time. Right. So for this timeless piece that, that people, keep in the family and maybe maybe pass down yeah, to a, yeah, a son that, or daughter. Yeah, that would be great. That would be perfect. Yeah, and so with that new uh, way we laid out the batteries, which is very common to have the, you know, a big battery pack up on, on the bottom mm -hmm. like that. So what I'm hoping is if in 10 years batteries are, you know, half as heavy but twice as, you know, energy dense or whatever, we'll have some kind of program where you bring it back and, you know, somehow we, you, you know, we, move, we make it happen. Yep. But I want you to have it for the rest of your life and, uh, because I know that I would want that. I drive away with this thing. I want to be able to come back and make sure I can own it forever. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so the, the CCS thing, I think it's a good way to go. I think there's a lot of collective momentum with automakers in general. 
Um, so even if you never did the, the Tesla supercharging thing, I think it would still work out and people would feel like they've got a lot of options in right. terms of uh, charging opportunities. One thing that, that I'll ask since I'm, it's top of mind to me, a question that's, that's come up uh, in discussions with, with Rivian, because Rivian is, is sort of trying to target that outdoor market. Um, have you thought about how people would charge in remote places? Have you given any thought to that? Uh, yeah, one is uh, because I was remote with my farm, so I know I would just charge on my farm kind of thing. Uh, but if you mean like when you go yeah. way off or it, yeah. way off-roading, I know a lot of people who uh, are big into off-roading will trailer their vehicle out there anyway, their, their Jeeps and whatnot. And if they're camping out there, they'll bring a generator for their own living. So it could be similar to that where you can uh, feed off a generator. A lot of... Uh, uh, you know, RV parks, or you know, if you're along the, going along the way, you can charge that way. Our vehicle will flat tow behind your RV, so you can go kind of anywhere with it and charge there along with your RV. So I think it's just always like you know, a lot of EV people will tell everyone, you just you just know your vehicle, you know the, where you're going, you plan a little bit. And, you know, you know, we're accustomed to a gas station being everywhere. You don't have to think about it. You know, a little bit of thought, and you, you know, it's not that hard, and yeah. you can you can live a, a better life with an EV, right? With just a little bit of planning. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm extremely excited about what Bollinger is doing. It's 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 a cool story to hear mm -hmm. how you've um, self-funded the company to date and uh, created this this product with a lot of challenges and obstacles along along the way yeah, and yeah. so far it's been a great success story yeah. and um, you know I'm, I'm looking forward to to getting behind the wheel of one of these yeah, at some point and in and, and seeing you know how it does and how it performs and uh, would love to see these on the road more and more oh great thanks so much for coming in this has been great yeah yeah absolutely I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have the invite and um, uh, I'm looking forward to some some new news coming soon, right? Because yeah. you've got some announcements that are coming later this year that you'll probably uh, share with everyone at some point soon. Yeah, I'm hoping to announce our uh, production facility very soon, our battery provider very soon, and price point soon after that, which everyone wants, of course. And then uh, just like you know, sub service, you know, yep. support, all that kind of stuff. So we have a million things to do, but a lot of announcements this year. Yes. And if someone wants to sort of learn more about this, um, you're taking deposits for, for the Not vehicles? deposits. We're not, we're not taking any money yet, but uh, you can reserve online. So on BollingerMotors.com. So putting yeah. in information, yeah, little, contact information. And our new website is going to be up in a week or so. Great. But, um, and more about Detroit and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, you can reserve there right online. We're up to 27,000 reservations. Super cool. And um, that's no money down, no sure. price point announced. So obviously, it's, take it with a grain of salt. But uh, it shows how many people are interested in what we're doing. I, I, I think I hope. think there's a ton more people who would be interested in this as things progress. Some of these details become more solidified. I mean, right. I, I, there's a lot of cars being sold every single year. Something to the tune of like 800,000 right. vehicles. Of course, not everyone is going to be interested in in this because it's it's super niche, but. Um, I think there's a lot of people, more than 27,000, that, that are going to be interested in, in uh, purchasing one of these. I'm going to so, quote you on that. Yes, ex exactly. <laughs> hold, hold me to it. I mean, you know, if you take a snapshot of two years from now, two, three years from now, I think the collective interest in electric vehicles will continue to grow, right. which will increase the potential market share of right. Bollinger. And, I mean, for, for people who remember the, the Land Cruisers and the Scouts and the right. you know, 1960s Jeeps, I think this is really going to get them really, really excited. Great. So great. thanks again. Thank really you. appreciate thanks it. For and that. Looking thanks forward for the to encouragement. Hearing. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll talk soon. Cool. Thanks.